church. We're here today to worship God on the day that he asked us to be here to worship him. Amen. Now, would everybody uh, sitting near somebody just turn around and welcome them, tell them thank you for being here? We have some general announcements today I'll give you. Today at 5 p.m. at Roger and Angie Pohl's home is Vespers, Potluck, Tosada Supper, and a bonfire. Bring your items for the Potluck Supper and your lawn chairs for the bonfire. Now, I've been to different one. Oh, it's a wonderful get-together time. It's really a blessing. Sing some hymns, enjoy each other's company in the evening. Today, November 12th, is the end of our toiletry collection. That's the uh, articles that's going to be handed out to people restricted to homes, to older people that can't go out on their own. It's for uh, homebound seniors. These items will be taken to the tender hearts and from there distributed before Thanksgiving. Carolyn says, thank you everyone for your generosity. Prayer meeting. No, tomorrow, oh, tomorrow, November 13th, it's church board meeting. We will meet at, uh, doesn't give a time. 9.30. 9.30, the regular time. Tomorrow, November 13th, is, yeah, is the board meeting. Prayer meeting on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Please read chapters 52 and 53 of the Desire of Ages. If you don't make that, that, uh, study you're missing out on a wonderful time we have a great leader and it's really it's interactive and everybody learns and has a great time next Sabbath November 12th uh, that, well, November 19th I'm sorry Pat and Ruth are inviting all of their home after church services for a lunch so if you come to service you're going to get some of the best chili you ever had in your life or potato soup Plus desserts. Try to arrange that if you can. You skipped Carolyn's Thursday study. What? You skipped Thursday. Carolyn's study Thursday. The one above it, Thursday. Just the evening. Anyway, Thursday, 11 a.m. is the Bible study at Carolyn's house. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're right, I missed it. The singing group that visited Tim last Sabbath. Now we had a group go over after church service and sing some hymns for Tim. And they had a, they had a great time. And Tim uh, played the guitar and sang a song for them, Old Rugged Cross. But both, both sides, they just had a wonderful time. And that's, that's a good thing to do. The food service department of the Rock Hill Public Schools has a $125,000 budget deficit because of students not being able to pay for their lunches. Students are fed, but the deficit grows. The director is interested in help from us, as is, as is Leslie's elementary school. Now, we've been taking our change for collection out here at a side table, and anytime we have change, we've been putting it in there, then taking it over and donating it to the school. And it's a good thing we feed the kids. Everybody deserves a, you know, a good meal. And I guess that's it for announcements. Let me, but can I, for all of the board members, I just wanted to ask you to check your emails. We sent out uh, some of the estimates for the roof that was done, it gives you a chance to look over it. Ruth sent it out last night. So if you get a chance to look over it, that will, it's, it'll expedite the board meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's 
it's now time for our praise service and um, I've read to you before from this book it's uh, 40 days of prayers and devotions on praising God and this morning the reading I have is praise the Father it is natural and in some ways easier for Christians to focus on Christ than on the Father Christ became one of us. Many verses tell us of him living a righteous, obedient life for us. They tell of him suffering for us and dying on the cross for our sins. By faith in Christ, we have his righteousness to our account. We are forgiven our sins and have eternal life. Christ is our all-sufficient Savior. I believe Christ wants us to realize deep within our hearts who the Father is and how great is his matchless love for us. I believe that every believer who grows in their Christian experience will come to know and appreciate the Father more and more. They will grow in their understanding of the Father's love for them. Jesus, in his prayer recorded in John, tells us that the Father loves us just as much as he loves Jesus, John 17, 23. Jesus would have us understand the love of the Father, and he seeks to draw us to him by presenting his parental grace, and that's from the Youth's Instructor, December 15, 1892. It is important to remember that it is the Father who sent his Son to save us. It is the Father who draws us to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Of this, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me to draw him. John 6, 44. Jesus instructs us to say, our Father, when we pray, <clears throat> Matthew 6, 9. We are praying to our loving Heavenly Father. It is He who gives us our daily bread, forgives our trespasses, and delivers us from evil. Humanity is incapable of defining God or completely understanding all about Him. God has revealed himself as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet the Bible tells us the Lord our God is one Lord, Deuteronomy 6, 4. We learn of God throughout eternity. And that learning, we will learn of God throughout eternity, and that learning will be without end. Concerning the relationship between the Father and Son, Ellen White wrote, the Father gave himself to the world in the gift of his Son. It was the love of the Father for fallen man that devised, in union with the Son, the plan of redemption. How did the Father give of himself in Jesus? I don't truly understand it. Jesus did say, I and my Father are one, John 10:30. As I have come to a better, this is the author speaking, as I have come to better understand what scripture teaches about my heavenly father, I have come to know and love him more. He has become more personal to me. When I pray, I pray to my father in the name of Jesus. I truly feel praise in my heart toward the father, and I believe yeah. Christ wants every Christian to praise their heavenly father from the depths of their soul as well. This is um, a, a very nice book that will teach us to praise, praise God, praise Jesus, praise, be thankful for the blessings that we have. Amen. Because there's so many different ones. I mean, when you just stop to think about it, we have our homes, we have our food, necessities, but still we have um, the beautiful leaves, the flowers, everything that he created to bless us. 
Okay, would everybody please stand? It's now time for our call to worship. The words are in your bulletin. Please remain standing uh, for our opening hymn. It's number 73, Holy, Holy, Holy. Oh, 
Appeal is from the book of John, chapter 6, and in this chapter we have the miraculous account of Jesus feeding the 5,000 by multiplying the seven loaves of bread and two fish. After everyone had their fill, the leftovers were collected and nothing was wasted. John 6 12 says, when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. We can worship God with our resources when we follow God's instructions about the economy and savings. In several instances, God has taught to his children the practice of saving. He inspired Joseph, the son of Jacob, to advise Pharaoh not to eat everything during the seven years of abundance, but to keep 20% for later, and we know why. On the night the Israelites had to celebrate the first Passover before leaving Egypt, God's first instruction for them was to get the right size lamb according to the number of people in each family so that nothing would be wasted. At the end of the multiplication of bread and fish, the clear admonition was let nothing be wasted. In Proverbs 20, 21, 20, it says the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but the fool, the foolish, gulp theirs down. No thought for tomorrow. This same message about Pennywise is important in many places today. We are preparing and eating more than we need daily, buying more than we need to wear, and building houses with far more space than we need to live in. Our consumption-oriented society influences us to adopt this standard other than the need to acquire goods affordably. Many say, well, if I can pay for it with the available money that I have or borrow from so-and-so or charge it, there's no problem with purchasing it. But then after that, many are found in debt. This can be socially acceptable, but is this good stewardship? No doubt, saving will help us to prepare for life's emergency, realize major financial goals, prepare for retirement, leave a financial legacy, and in some cases, break the cycle of poverty. Furthermore, and more importantly, 
we will be in a better position to partner in God's mission. Jesus and his missionary crew were supported by a group of women who used their own means. This is in Luke 8, 3. The early church members whose wealth was in the form of lands and houses sold their properties to provide for the beginning of the Christian Christian's mission. This is in Acts 4, 34. Ellen G. White challenges us to properly channel our resources. She said, each one should keep a missionary box at hand and drop into it every penny that he is tempted to waste in self-indulgence. This is in Councils of Stewardship, page 291. Isn't it time to identify and fix the cracks in our financial lives? This week we have another opportunity to use part of our savings to worship God by bringing to Him our tithe and offerings. It is all of us in response to all of Him. Would the deacon please come forward? Oh. stand for our doxology. us so abundantly and you have given us the opportunity to partner with you in your mission Lord help us grant us the wisdom that we need each and every day to manage responsibly the resources that you have given to us Lord Father now we ask that you bless our tithe and offerings in Jesus name we pray amen you may be seated it's now time for our garden of prayer. Please kneel if you're able. Sabbath to worship you and to thank you for being a loving God. 
You came down to this earth to be a sacrifice for our sins. You willingly died to save us. We pray that we are worthy of this eternal gift. Dear God, we pray now that you will enlighten our speaker and that we will receive the message from you through him. In Jesus' holy name we give thanks. Amen. A portion of the word of God by which we will be enlightened and that is as well our scripture reading. We find it in the book of Easter, chapter 4, in verses 13 and 14. Easter 4, 13 and 14. And the word, uh, please stand to read the word of God. And the word of God says, And Mordecai told them to enter Easter, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Blessed be the word of God. You may be seated. It's very nice to see everybody out here today. How many of you are feeling blessed by your Lord, our Father in heaven? Amen. Amen. You know, we are a very blessed church. We have such talent in here. I, I must say, I, I'm so happy with some of the things that have taken place in this church. Carolyn stepping up to play the piano. Carolyn, you've done a fabulous job. I can't believe how competent you've become on the piano in such a short time. And having music in church is such a blessing, amen? Amen. And you know, we have also such good people up front. I was listening to Norma, and I was thinking, she, she should start doing uh, sermons as well as she did. Amen. We do have some talented people in this church. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a good church. Thank God that he gives us a place to come where we have those that believe as we do and care for each other. And that is the important thing, caring for each other. Amen. Today, I'll be presenting a shortened version of the story of Esther, which is found in the 17th book of the Bible. Many years ago, I read the book of Esther, and I wondered why it was included in the Bible. Yet, I know that every word God provides us has a meaning and a purpose, but at that time, I was unable to comprehend what God was revealing to me. Now I am older and I pay much more attention to the good and the bad in this world. I believe it is a sign to let us know how quickly things can go from good to bad and then from bad to good. That we have to follow and have faith in God's plan, no matter what is happening around us. For he has a plan to reach each and every one of us. He has a plan to provide us to have our freedom of choice as to who we will serve. He is shining a bright light on Satan so that we can make a well-informed choice. The choice is between love of self and love of others. He loves each of us beyond our understanding, but unlike Satan, 
He will not force you to make that choice. Amen? Amen. This story happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 territories, stretching from India to Ethiopia. King Xerxes ruled his empire from the royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of all media Persia, as well as the princes and nobles of the territories. The celebration lasted 180 days. A tremendous supply of wealth in it, of the empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people from the greatest to the least who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautiful. Drinks were served in golden goblets and many of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of the king's Xerxes. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring the queen to him with a royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to the queen, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. He immediately consulted with his wise advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs. What must be done to Queen Vashti? The king demanded. What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? His advisors answered the king. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout the Media Persia will hear what the queen did and will start to treat their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. So if it pleases the king, we suggest that you issue a decree, a law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be ever banished from the presence of King Xerxes, and the king should choose another queen worthier than she. So King Xerxes sent letters to all parts of the empire to each province in its own scripture and language and proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his home and should say whatever he pleases. <laughs> then, this personal attendance decided to find a new queen. Let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are properly taken care of and given beauty treatments. After that, the young women who most please the king will be made queen to replace Vashti. This was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan in effect. Is this in the Bible, Doctor? I believe it is. 
At the time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress whose name was Mordecai, son of Jer. He was the tribe of, but he was from the tribe of Benjamin. His family had been among those who had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadasha, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her to be provided for her beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace. And he moved her and his maids into the best place in the harem. I asked that similar question many years ago. <laughs> Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had dedicated her not to do so. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing and jewelry she wanted to take. Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace, and the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her, he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. One day, as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, Two of the king's eunuchs, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai the credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were hung on the gallows. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman over all the nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect as the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's commandment? They spoke to him day after day but he still refused to comply to the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct. Mordecai told them he was a Jew and he only bowed down to his Lord God. When Haman saw Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there's a certain race scattered through all the territories of your empire 
who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Hmm, sounds familiar. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed, and I will give 10,000 bags of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. The king agreed, confirming this decision by removing his ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do as you see fit. So the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated it. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's ring. Messengers were sent to all territories of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day that was scheduled to happen on the March 7th of next year. We'll need to pay attention to that day. The property of the Jews was to be given to those that killed them. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on a burlap and ashes, and went out into the city, crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. As the news of the king's decree reached all the territories, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted wept and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was depressed and distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her as an attendant. She ordered him to give Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So her servants went to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story. Mordecai gave a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked her servant to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked the servant to direct her to go to the king and beg for mercy and plead for her people. So Esther's servant returned to Mordecai with the message. Then Esther told her servant, go back and rely, re, re, relay this to the message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people of the territories know that any one who appears before the king in his court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out the gold scepter and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So Esther's servant gave the message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent the reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, 
you will escape when all the Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at the time like this, the deliverance and relief of the Jews will arise from some or other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. And Esther sent the reply to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days. My maids and I will do the same. And then I will go and see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything Esther had ordered him. On the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace, just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Then the king asked her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. And Esther replied, if it pleases the king, let the king of Haman, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet that I have prepared for the king. The king turned to his attendants and said, tell Haman to come quickly to the banquet as Esther has requested. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. And while they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, now tell me why, what you really want. What is your request? Esther replied, this is my request and deepest wish. Please come with Haman tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for you. Then I will explain what this is all about. Haman was a happy man as he left the banquet. But when he saw Mordecai sitting at that palace gate, not standing up or trembling nervously before him, Haman became furious. However, he restrained himself and went home. Then Haman gathered together his friends and his wife, and he boasted to them about how great his wealth and his, how many children he had. He bragged about the honor of the king had given him and how he had been promoted over all the other nobles and officials. Then Haman added, and that's not all. Queen Esther invited me and the king himself to a banquet she prepared for us. And she invited me to dine with her and the king again tomorrow. Then he added, but this is all worth nothing as long as I see that Mordecai the Jew sitting there at the palace gate. So Haman's wife and his friends suggested, build a tall gallows in your courtyard. And in the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai hung on it. When this is done, you can go on your merry way to the banquet with the king. Well, this pleased Haman, and he ordered the gallows to be built. That night, the king had trouble sleeping. So he ordered an attendant to bring the book of the history of his reign so he could read it to him. In those records, he discovered 
an account of Mordecai had exposed the plot of the two eunuchs who guarded the door of the king's private quarters where they had plotted to kill the king. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? The king asked. The attendants replied, nothing has ever been done for him. Who is that in the outer court? The king inquired. As it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared. So the attendants replied to the king, Haman is out in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in and the king had said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes as well as a horse that has the king himself has ridden, one with the emblem on the head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout out as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Excellent, said king, the king to Haman. Quick, take the robes and my horse and do just as you've said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate in the palace. Leave out nothing you have suggested. How quickly things can change. So Haman took the robes and put them on Mordecai, placed them on the king's own horse, and led him through the city square shouting, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the palace gate. But Haman, he hurried home, dejected and completely humiliated. The king's eunuchs arrived at Haman's home and told Haman he was to go to the banquet that Esther had prepared. So Haman went to the Queen Esther's banquet. On this second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, Tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? Queen Esther replied, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had been merely sold as slaves, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Who would do such a thing? King Circus demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped up to his feet in complete rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was 
reclining, just as the king was returning from his palace garden. The king exclaimed, well, he even assaults the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes. And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered the face of Haman, signaling his doom. Then one of the king's eunuchs said, Haman was set, Haman has set up a tall gallows in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to hang Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then hang Haman on it, the king ordered. So they hung Haman on the gallows and he had set up for Mordecai and the king's anger was subsiding. On that same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king for Esther had told the king how they were related. The king took off his ring that he had taken back from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of Haman's property. Then Esther went before the king, falling down at his feet and begging him with tears to stop the evil plot devised by Haman against the Jews. Again, the king held out the gold scepter to Esther, so she rose and stood before him. Esther said, if it pleases the king, let there be a decree that reverses the order of Haman, who ordered the Jews throughout all the king's <clears throat> territories should be destroyed. For how can I endure to see my people and my family slaughtered and destroyed? Then King Xerxes said to the queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, now go ahead and send out a message to the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want and seal it with the king's ring. But remember this, whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed with the ring cannot be revoked. So the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Mordecai has dictated. It was sent to the Jews and to the highest officers, the governors and the nobles of all 127 territories. The decree was written in the scripts and languages of all the people of the empire, including that of the Jews. The king's decree gave the Jews in every city authority to unite and defend their lives. They were allowed to kill, slaughter, and annihilate anyone of any nationality or territory who might attack them or the children or their wives and take the property of their enemies. The day that was chosen for the event throughout all the territories of King Xerxes was March 7th of the next year. So on March 7th, of the, the two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had to hope, had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. So the Jews went on an appointed day and struck down their enemies with the sword. They killed, annihilated their enemy, and they did as they pleased with those who hated them. In the fortress of Susa itself, the Jews killed 500 men, but they did not take any plunder. That very day, when the king was informed of the number of people killed in the fortress of Susa, he called for Queen Esther. He said, the Jews have killed 500 men in the fortress of Susa alone, as well as Haman's 10 sons. 
if they have done that here, what have they happened in the rest of the territories? But what more do you want? Esther responded. If it please the king, give the Jews and Susa permission to do again tomorrow as they have done today. So the king agreed and the decree was announced in Susa. Then the Jews at Susa gathered before on March 8th and killed 300 more men. And again, they took no plunder. Meanwhile, the other Jews throughout the king's territory had gathered together to defend their lives. They gained relief from all their enemies, killing 75,000 of those who hated them. But they did not plunder. These days would be remembered and kept from generation to generation and celebrated by every family throughout the territories and cities of the empire. This celebration would never cease to be celebrated among the Jews, nor would the memory of what happened ever die out among the descendants. Mordecai, the Jew, became the prime minister with authority next to that of King Xerxes. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak for the welfare of their descendants. As we can clearly see, people and their love for power was not much different then than it is here today. God is willing to help those who do for others rather than do for themselves. For God wants us to have the power of love, not the love of power. Mm. God has asked each of us to serve, not to be served. We take out self, when we take self out of the picture and place love of others first, we are serving our Lord in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, all around us is evil. We pray to you this day that your will be done, that you protect us from the evil ones who are willing to harm us. May many of your good followers step up to serve rather than to be served. May we bow on our knees to you, Father, who has done all for us that we might be saved. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who has paid the price for our sins. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This time, I believe uh, Vivian will do our music. Our hymn of dedication is number 121, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Number 121, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Please stand.
thank you that you've provided us the Bible so that your word can be with us. It is through this word that we have learned the power of love and that we know that your word is always about love of each other. And Father, may we be able to clearly differentiate between those that love power versus those that have the power of love. Strengthen us, Father, with all your words so that we wake up and we serve you accordingly. As we leave this church today, let us take your word with us. Let us go out amongst those in the world and let them know you, Father, and you alone are king of this universe. We pray in your name, amen. 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 amen.